Have any of you tried to go without electricity for any period of time? And I'm not just talking about camping, right? Sure, we've all experienced some sort of outage, um, but how many of you would go down to the breaker box and just flip the switch and break the connection with the power lines coming in from the community and just live that way? Think about that. I think we've had those fun experiences where it's like, oh, get out the candles. That's great. Modern life is terrible. <laughs> but then, you know, then the lights came back on. Yay. You know, and if, if you did go down and flip the switch, you could certainly clean up all those countertop appliances, uh, which, you know, just looking around, uh, uh, seem to have bred like rabbits, right? <laughs> they just keep going. Uh, but it, electricity is just the way the world works, <laughs> at least now. It's the way we get things done. You can't imagine a world, or maybe you're trying. Imagine a world without electricity. You need it for daily life. And each one of us in our household pay into the system that supports the system for everybody else so that our neighbors can use it as well. And I want you to transition with me to think in the ancient world of Rome, to reject the worship of the gods was just about like going down to your breaker box and disconnecting the electricity from your home and your modern neighborhood. Because if you pay into the system of the worship of gods, you're respected and you keep it going. It's what makes us tick as a Roman society. But there's been this beautiful heritage of powerful resistance to the common culture that a remnant of Jewish people maintained throughout history. Now, you may know the story of Daniel, his three friends who were taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. That was in 605 BC. They were torn from their homes and, and lived through a, a really rough process that I won't expand on here, but but they didn't forget about Yahweh, and he didn't forget about them. They were elevated in leadership in a brutal, idol-worshiping nation, and they served in the administration of Babylon as well. I'm going to read Daniel 3 to you. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth six cubits, and he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, prefects, governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. All of them, right? <laughs> Including Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they, the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, the lyre, the trigon, horn, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. <laughs> Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every other kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews, these, these remnants. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning fiery furnace and that there are certain jews whom you've appointed over the affairs of the province of babylon shadrach meshach and abednego these are their 
They're Babylonian names. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you... You're ready when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made. Well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. <laughs> Just those three things put together sound really hot, don't they? And he says, and who is the God who will deliver you? out of my hands. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you on this matter. <laughs> wow. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Okay, pause for a second. Do you see this opposition? Uh, these, these are really good governors, really good administrators. They have been serving Babylon. And they say, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you on this matter. The, the subtext here is, if our God really is the God of gods the true and living God, um, then he'll be able to, to deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. We are officially off that grid. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He lost any hope that they would participate. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent, and the furnace was overheated. The flame of the fire killed those men who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste, and he declared to his counselors, Didn't we cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. And he answered, But I see four men, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace, and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins for there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Wow. 
So, you know, we just bow down to the idol and play along and keep the peace. No, the, the righteous remnant does not do that. Not at all. Um, yeah, we're not, we're not going to do that at all. In fact, we don't even feel the need to answer you. We're just not going to do it. But you're enemies of the state if you don't play along. Yeah, well, I want to fast forward 2,600 years to today. Before we go back 2,000 years into the book of Acts, there's a promise out there that if you just keep to yourselves your private truth about what you understand about Jesus, you know, your private truth, and just keep Jesus out of the public square, you'll be fine. But the threat is that if you announce public truth about Jesus the Messiah, there will be trouble. So, hailing Jesus as the Messiah, risen from the dead, royal offspring of, Je of the Jewish King David, is not going to be popular. When explained and preached correctly, it's upsetting to the flow of society. You stand out like a boulder in a river. Now, it's possible to have rights to worship, uh, you know, however, however you will, in one season of the church and not in another, or in one location and, and not the other. So how do we live in society in a way that stays faithful to the gospel? Well, first question, what, what is the gospel? Because if the message of the gospel is about private, personal transformation, well then, live and let live. You do your religion, whatever works for you, and I'll do mine. But if the message of the gospel of Jesus is what we've been reading about these last few chapters of Acts, then it's upsetting. In the last three cities, we've heard Paul proclaim that Jesus is Lord in Philippi, Jesus is King in Thessalonica, and Judge in Athens. The gospel is the disruptive news that the hope of Israel this Jesus of Nazareth is the resurrected King of the universe, Lord of all. It's disruptive. Paul would summarize his gospel, and we think it's the tightest formulation of the good news in 2 Timothy 2, verse 8. Remember, Jesus Christ, or Jesus the King, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, this is my gospel, says Paul. The gospel for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. So there's this, this question that's been hovering over the young church in the cities where Paul is announcing the lordship, the kingship, the judgeship of Jesus. And I've saved my comments until now about the controversy brewing in these cities. As Tom Wright puts it, the question is, does being a Christian mean you're acting illegally according to Roman law and custom? Should, should the Roman state be doing its best for its own reasons uh, outside of theological disputes with the still unbelieving synagogue community to be doing its best to stamp out the new movement? It may even be that the book of Acts, written by Luke to Theophilus, was sent along with Paul to his later trial before Caesar to explain that Paul's a good, faithful Jew, and Christians are the fulfillment of the Jewish way, and uh, they're the remnant, and, and they're not a departure from it. Because see, Rome was the empire who kept peace in the cities with great force, right? The Pax Romana was the peace that was enforced by stepping on the throats of those who opposed him. But also, we've talked in the past about the Pax Deorum, keeping peace up there in the skies with the gods, as well as down here. The government enforced imperial worship, the worship of the emperor, and the rest of society enforced the worship of other gods as well. It was just the way we do it, the price of doing business, except for the Jews. The Jews were obviously very serious about maintaining the true worship of Yahweh. We saw that, you know, 2,600 years before this. Um, 
and they would rather die than worship another god, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, Jos Josephus has reported that they had a deal worked out with Julius Caesar about 100 years before. In sum, they, they had the right um, to not serve in the army. They had the right to assemble according to the tradition of their ancestors, special days, food laws, etc. And they were also exempt from worshiping other gods that would be required of the normal person. Because the normal Roman life on the idolatry grid, as Tom Wright notes, included the daily acknowledgement of the divinities assumed to lie behind the carved statues to weekly, monthly, and annual processions, festivals, sacrifices, and everyone joined in. And anyone who suddenly opted out would be noticed and remarked upon. It was assumed throughout the ancient world that if anything bad happened to a city, such as a famine, a fire, flood, plague, or hostile attack, the gods were angry. Oh, what would en enrage them the most was neglect. So anyone who failed to perform the regular duties and take part in the regular festivals was therefore assumed to be a danger to the city and the community, right? The society is enforcing these rules. You might remember um, all the pandemic finger pointing about who was to blame for what's wrong in society. Yeah, it, it was like that. Paul, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians about their turn from idols, their repentance. First Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10, he says, You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So how do these Christian communities work together? Because there's the Jewish tradition. Remember the Jewish deal that the Jews could worship the Creator God and none of the others. We'll worship, uh, we'll worship only our God. We will not worship your God, but we will pray to our God for the Emperor. So I want you to hang with me here. Put yourself in this place. Let's say, let's say we're, we're back there. We Jews have our way of life. We're born into it. The traditions have been upheld in almost every city in the Roman Empire for a hundred years, right? We have all these historical figures of the remnant. But do we feel at home in Rome? No. When in Rome and Roman cities, do we just do as the Romans do? No, no, not at all. But we are alive. Uh, we're allowed to worship uh, the Creator God according to our traditions. So this is, this is good. And then the missionaries come. Paul is preaching in the synagogue that Jesus is the Messiah and that he is the risen Lord of all. And some of us believe, and our synagogue conversations get pretty lively. Lots of debate. Uh, but as, as Jewish background believers are baptized into the name of Jesus, we're, we're, we're becoming alive. And now we're meeting across the street from the synagogue as well uh, with Gentile background believers in Jesus. But, but our, our group is Jewish, right? So, I mean, we can worship how, how we want in our Roman city because we're Jews. Our hope is completed in Jesus the Messiah, but we're still worshiping Yahweh according to the traditions of our ancestors, and, and Jesus is now the center of it all. And so all is well, except for the Gentile background believers who, until yesterday, at their baptism, they were required to worship the gods and take part in the festivals. So, so wait, how do, how do they fit in? 
And culturally, are people perceiving this as a new religion that's looking for protection under the law? Or is this the completion of an ancient religion that has had the legal protections for the last hundred years since Julius Caesar? There's a, there's a controversy that's brewing. Do you see that? And probably just a year earlier, Emperor Claudius had sent the Jewish people out of Rome, including Jewish background followers of Jesus. Now, if the Gentiles have become Messiah people, and, and then they claim the heritage of the Hebrew scriptures, that's going to muddle the whole situation. And we could actually get kicked out of our city as well, like, like happened in Rome. So, hmm, how do the Jews set themselves apart from Paul and his new churches of Messiah people? I mean, the Jews knew that this was not just a private message of inner transformation. It was a radical way of life that's going to upset the Roman culture and custom. So is Christianity a crime in Rome? Well, let's head to the public courtroom, just a few verses in Acts here, and find out what the governor says. Acts 18, 12 through 17. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. Okay, so remember this has been happening city after city in, in many different ways, different angles. Uh, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. Which law? Which God? Well, the Creator God, uh, contrary to the law and the setup that we have. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or some heinous villainy, vicious crime, O oh Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of question about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him up in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to this. <laughs> they bring him before the judgment seat. They bring him before a public display. And they say, this guy has done a crime. And the crowd's like, oh, okay, what's the crime? What's the crime? Gallio says, I refuse to be a judge of these things. And the crowd's like, get out of here. And, he, and they seized Sosthenes. He says, get out of here. They seize this guy, the ruler of the synagogue, who hasn't been a ruler very long because the other ruler just got saved. And maybe Sosthenes is the same one we see in... Later in the letters that uh, maybe he's now a follower of Jesus as well. But they beat him in front of the tribunal and Gallio says, don't care. Don't care at all. And just like that, the precedent was set that Christians were basically Jews except for some minor squabbles. And Gallio, uh, the brother of the famous Roman philosopher Seneca, has thrown them out of court. And that's going to stick as a new precedent. So it's legal. <laughs> it's legal. And I just want to do a few takeaways with us. Um, I know this is a history lesson, but I think it's context for a lot of the letters that are written and the Jewish Gentile controversy. And we're going to get kicked out if we have these Gentiles in here. And besides, they're different from us. But here's some takeaways. The remnant is always different. You're just going to be different. If you are part of the remnant, the righteous remnant, you're just going to be different. You turn from idols and serve the living God. The remnant is loyal and subversive. <laughs> loyal and subversive. Think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, we're going to serve our society. We're going to be the best citizens you can possibly find. And we're not going to turn to your idols. Well, that's a contradiction. Is it, though? <laughs> because we serve the true and living God. What else did you want us to do? Third, the, the remnant is filled with hope. We saw that in First Thessalonians. 
we await the return of the true king. Hmm. We're, that's our hope. We look for the come soon and coming king. We live in anticipation. And the remnant is filled with his presence. Think back, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Wow, those people, there's something different. In fact, there's more of them than we thought. <laughs> That's correct. There was another in the fire. There they were with the worst that the nation could throw at them, and they find themselves comforted with God's presence. So yes, we are filled with hope. We await the true and the coming king, but we're also filled with his presence. This doesn't make sense to a lot of people because we are a paradox. We are a contradiction. But let me just finish with the words from Paul to this church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 31. The word of cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Plug into that power. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Right? We're going to be different. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Hey, Remnant, what do you have to boast about? Just one thing. The hope of Israel, this Jesus of Nazareth, is the resurrected King of the universe, Lord of all, and he's the power into which we plug.